<coughs> Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope everybody's okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're having a Google Hangout uh, tonight. It's a special evening. Um, a brother in Christ, uh, a dear brother, Mark, is going to share with us a Bible study on suffering. And um, he wants me to uh, just interact with him and so we just trust that God will be with us and um, that God will bless this Bible study and that we'd all get closer to the Lord through it and encouraged through it. So I'll hand over to Mark and uh, you lead us through the evening, Mark. So over to you. Yeah. Well, I just thought we'd look at um, suffering. And um, one of the barriers to faith, one of the number one barriers to faith, is the problem of evil and suffering in the world. You know, if, if people ask if God is real and God is good and God is powerful, mm. why is there so much suffering? Mm. And this was known as the uh, the theodicy dilemma, which is God is all powerful, God is all good, and yeah. God is all knowing. So why suffering and evil? Yeah. And there was a few conclusions. People say the first thing is God wants to remove suffering and evil, but can't. Mm. So he's not all powerful or he's not all knowing. Mm. That's one option people take. The second option is God can remove suffering, so he's all powerful, but he does not. Mm. In which case, he cannot be all good and all loving. So either one of those two limit God's, limits God's character. Yeah. It either limits his, his omnipotence or his omniscience mm. or, or his goodness. But the Christian answer is, you know, God is all powerful. God is all good. God is all knowing but allows suffering and evil. So the, the question is, on every, everyone asks is why? If God is so powerful, God is so good and God is so knowing why does evil and suffering mm. exist and obviously the answer is we've got to go back to the question where did suffering and evil originate mm. you know and, and we know about um, the, the story of the garden mm. Adam and Eve where um, Eve was tempted with the um, do you want to do you want to talk a bit about that, Jade? To the introduction about the fall. Uh, yeah, well, um, just get my Bible. Uh, yeah, basically, God gave created Adam and Eve, and then he he, he put boundaries there. He put a boundary. And the boundary was not to eat of the fruit of knowledge. Um, and it says, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, uh, 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and some it." and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth and God said behold I have given you every plant to yield yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree that seed is seed in its fruit you shall have them for food and to every beast <clears throat> um, sorry sorry mate uh, I think we've yeah. got chapter three, J. Yeah. You know the the fall bit. Yeah. I'll just okay. I'll just read chapter two, verse fifteen, and then I'll. It says that the Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, "You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die." And then chapter three. Now, verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than the other beast of the field than the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows when you will eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to take make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate, and the eyes of both were opened. So basically they were empiricists, they trust the senses rather than God's word, they rebelled yeah. against God, took the fruit, and then all hell breaks loose, suffering comes into the world because of what they've done. Yeah. So, the question to um, the answer, sorry, the answer to the, an the answer to the question: where, where, where did evil originate? It originated in Adam and Eve disobeying God. They were told that they could eat of every tree in the garden apart from one. And they were told that if they eat from that one tree, they would die. So how to understand this is, they were given 99% freedom, and the only restriction was that 1% one, one tree. But they were deceived, and, and they fell into sin. And that's how that's when sin came into that universe. They were separated from God, and they were ashamed, and they hid from God. And that's when... You, the problems of the world began with sin and out of that sin came two evils there's moral there's moral evil which is suffering that stems from the action of the people responsible mm. for example murder murder theft a lot of suffering mm. is caused by men and then there's there's natural evil which is suffering from the result of natural disasters such as floods famine and earthquakes. Mm. So a lot of the suffering in the world originates from man, <coughs> not God. Yeah, yeah. And um, but be because of because of the garden, you know, God gave Adam and Eve free will. Yeah. He gave them free will to choose to obey Him or not. And there's a quote here from um, this is actually from. A theologian. He says, Love cannot exist without a choice. In order to be able to truly love someone, we first need freedom not to love them, even to hate them if we choose. Mm. Without this freedom, there would be no love, merely, merely indifference, because we couldn't do things differently. Our behavior would just be the result of the way we were programmed to perform. Freedom is the greatest gift that God could give to his creation because it's the gift that truly brings us to life. So God could have, people say, well, why didn't God stop this sin coming into the world and suffering yeah. by just, you know, not putting a tree there? Yeah. Why didn't he intervene when Adam and Eve were partaken from the tree? And the thing is about this is, God gives us free will. You know, for God to intervene would make him a control freak. You know, relationships don't work by another person being dominant. <laughs> there, has, yeah. there has to be a participation. There has to be a relationship going on. So what we're saying is God did not bring about suffering and evil. evil. It was the result of the fall of humanity. Yeah. in disobeying God. Uh, Oswald Chambers said this. He says, The root of all sin is the belief that God is not good and does not have our best interests at heart. Adam and Eve believed God was holding something back. Wow. The devil yeah. deceived them yeah. and said, God is holding something back. Yeah, yeah. So... We go back to this, you know, to understand suffering and evil, we need to understand the heart and character of God. And we find the heart and character of God by going back to the beginning. Yeah. yeah. What is the heart of God? You know, at, at the beginning, 
at the beginning story, at the beginning of God's story of history, man, Adam and Eve, li lived in perfect harmony with God. <coughs> they were blessed. Mm. They had everything they needed. In the beginning, it was all good with no evil and suffering. But the good news is, is in the end, when Christ comes back, it says God is going to wipe every tear from our eyes, where God will deal with evil and suffering once and for all. You know, God is good and desires to bless us with his goodness. Yeah. A lot of people say this, a lot of these atheists today, they all talk about, you know, how how real, people who believe in God can become evil and, and cause war. It, it leads to war and it leads to violence. Yeah. You know, um, religion causes violence and evil. Well, if you look at the cross of Jesus, if you look if you look at redemption. Yeah. Um, <coughs> God in his son Jesus Christ had violence and evil done to him wow he had violence and evil inflicted on him so there's that to think about as well wow. and um, a lot of people I found when you, when you talk to them about suffering yeah they ask these big questions, you know, why, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why does, doesn't God stop this? Why doesn't God stop that? And when you get down to it, what you really find is the question they're asking is this, why am I suffering? Yeah, yeah. It's about their own personal suffering, really, because what I found is this, every time I've talked to someone, this may be a bit offensive, but the number one thing is people, people talk about the starving in Ethiopia. Why doesn't God stop all that? If God was good, he wouldn't have people starving in Africa and India. Yeah, yeah. And I say to them, well, you know, how much money do you actually give to these organizations? <laughs> and they'll say, well I, well, I don't give anything. And then I say to them, well, you obviously can't be that bothered then, can you? And it sounds offensive, but let's get at the heart of the issue. Yeah. Let's not blame God. The things when we don't do anything ourselves wow. to lift the burden. That's brilliant, mate. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. But what I want to get to really is, is simply <coughs> the questions I want to look at. Is this is uh, what benefit can can come from experiencing evil and suffering? In other words, what I want to say is God uses. Although suffering and evil was not in God's perfect plan, yeah. he allowed it to come into the universe. And now he uses suffering and evil to bring about his own redemptive plans. Yeah. So we're in a world where sin is real, evil is real, and suffering is real. How do we as Christians, how do we deal with that? Yeah. How do we do? How do we deal with that? And so, what benefit can come from Christians experiencing um, suffering? Mark. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. Uh, just well, just two quick things is like you're talking about the nature of suffering. Like for an atheist, uh, they can't um, account for evil really because. And, and suffering because ultimately there is no evil you know you can only talk about evil if you can talk about something that's ultimately good so you need, yeah. to, you need to borrow the Christian worldview to talk about these things it, to have any sense and for Buddhism as well Buddhism tries to get rid of suffering by getting into Nevada into your thoughts but if you get into Nevada it still doesn't avoid the fact that you're suffering so it still doesn't deal with the issue. So, yeah. so Christianity yeah. is the only one who hits it, hits yeah. it dead on, and gives you resources. Sorry, mate. Yeah. No, that's right, Jay. It's good. <clears throat> I just want to say this, right? 
God's highest purpose in the universe for us is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, mm. who is holy. <coughs> so everything we experience in life, mm. in God's heart, is, is for us to grow in holiness. Yeah. So what I'm saying is God's redemptive plan is always about holiness. So the benefit we can experience, well, I'm going to go through it, I've listed a few, is what God is doing is he's helping us grow towards holiness. Yeah. So the first thing is what benefit can come from experiencing evil and, evil and suffering is it develops our faith by making it stronger and more authentic. So we have a growth towards holiness that is developing our faith by making it stronger and more authentic. First Peter one three nine backs this up. It says this: In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Mm. These have come. These have come, mm. so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Yeah. There's a key word in here. Well, what this is saying is, you know, God <coughs> uses trials yeah. and tribulations and griefs to refine our faith it says that it may be proved genuine yeah. you know God is looking for a genuine faith he uses suffering and evil so that we are the real deal a genuine faith not spiritual fakes yeah 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 but being um, but being tested you know, God's called concern with being genuine. I don't know if you've ever seen the film, The Shawshank Redemption. <coughs> yeah. Well, there's a, a character in there called Red, and he's been in prison for a lot of years, and every couple of years he goes for, um, he goes before a panel, I can't remember what the system's called, where he, he, he gets asked if he's changed and if, and if he feels rehabilitated. Yeah. And it's showing you the clips and he's going in and he's, um, he's, he's acting pretty fake. He's going, yes, yes, I've definitely changed. I'm a changed man. And they keep rejecting him. They keep stamping. He's the form. And anyway, his friend comes in. And, and I think his name's Andrew Defoe or something like that. I can't pronounce his name. But he has this bonding with this friend of his. And his friend keeps dreaming of the day he's going to get out of prison. Yeah. <laughs> and his, his friend gets out of prison and he's over the moon, this red. You know, and he can't believe that his friends got out. And in the end scene of the film, he goes before this panel again, and he's just there's no smile on his face. He's just he's just sort of looking really serious. And they're asking him questions, and they're saying, "Do you think you've been rehabilitated?" And he says, "I don't know what that means." And um, and he, he basically he talks about how. He can't change his past. What he did is, is what he did. Yeah. And that, that, that man who done that, that young boy who done that crime, is, he's gone and he's dead. And what's left is this old man. And he says to them, just stamp your books on him. Stop wasting my time. And he says, because to tell you the truth, I don't care anymore. And he to stamp it and he gets out of prison. And the thing is, when he was going in before, he was all fake. Yeah. But <clears throat> towards the end, he goes in as himself. Which is his genuine, he, he's pained. Yeah. And the message I got from the film is when he, when he stopped pretending uh, and he gave himself over to, to the fact that he might, he might die in prison, he actually gets out. Yeah. But, you know, he, he was genuine. I'm just, I'm just doing a, I'm just doing a on, on the on Jason. Oh, hi, Jay. Hi, Claire, how you doing, mate? Hi. Are you I'm all right? Good. You are? are you okay, mate? I'm good. Just come back from a 
kids leaders meeting. Oh. It's good. I've written knackered and we'll have a cup of tea. Oh, okay, mate. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. So he's he's another one as well to back it up to you from James chapter one verses two to four. Yeah. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces <laughs> patience. Mm. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See there, mature faith that's been tested by trials. Mm. What was that? Produces like? patience. What what scripture was that? Hebrews four was it? It's James one. Oh, James one, yeah. Verses two to four. Okay, mate. Yeah. Yeah. You know when we when we're going through trials, Jay. Yeah. We can say to God, "What's going on? Why are you leading me in this way? Why has this happened?" Yeah. When we're in the, when we're in that suffering, we can say. To God, why are we why are we on this path? Why this journey? Why this way? And Miles Monroe says this. I think this is a great quote, one of the best quotes I've ever read. He says, "There is no hurried way to get to God's vision. He leads us step by step, step by step, day by day, through tribulations, trials." And character building opportunities as he moves us towards our call and dreams. Yeah. Why does God lead us this way? Because he doesn't want us only to win, he wants us to win in style. God's desire is to fashion people with character and battle scars who can say, God didn't just hand me this vision, I have qualified for it. Yeah. And I just love that because it's, it's talking about what you were talking about earlier on. There's no hurried way to get to God's plan. Yeah. And God's best for us is for us to have that genuine faith. Yeah, yeah. To be authentic. Like you said about people who come into the ministry who aren't broken. Yeah. You know, they have, they have issues, God still uses them. But for God's best, we have to be broken. Yeah. <clears throat> we have to have a faith that is authentic. Yeah. That's been yeah. tested through trials and through suffering. Mm. So th what I'm saying is, what benefit can come from experiencing evil and suffering? A growth towards holiness that develops our faith yeah. by making yeah. it stronger and more authentic. The second one is a growth towards holiness that not just develops our faith, but develops our character. Mm. Develops our character. Um, there's some things God puts us through yeah. that develops our character in ways that we wouldn't get in any other way. Like, I faced some things in the past that have shaped my character that I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I would have got any other way. Yeah, yeah. It says in Job 23.10, <coughs> But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Amen, mate. Amen. I like that scripture. And um, now this, this here, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. This is a bit. You might not agree with this, Jay. But I want to give a. I read about the, Jew, the Jewish context of the Book of Job. Yeah. Like. Right? If you ask any Western theologian or biblical scholar, yeah, what is the book of Job about? What is the heart of the book of Job? Yeah, they'll say the book of Job is, is, is a book about human suffering. Yeah, yeah. But it's actually about God's faithfulness. Oh wow! I never thought in human that. suffering. It's not just the context of Job. It's about God's faithfulness. Yeah, and you know. It says about what when people talk about the book of Job. Yeah. Now you might disagree with this, right? They always focus on the suffering he went through. Yeah. Which was very real. Yeah. But sometimes they forget about the end of the book as well, the end of the story. Yeah, yeah. And it says this. This is the end. This is the end of the story. It says, "Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning." 
Yeah. So I had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. As you know, um, we think that people who don't give up are blessed. You have heard the job was patient. And you have seen what the Lord finally did for him. The Lord is full of tender mercy and loving concern. Now, the thing is, I'm not saying, I mean, before this, Job lost, lost his children yeah. and lost everything. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and we're not we're not saying well it's all right because he got more kids in the end anyway. Yeah, yeah. We're not saying that it was awful what he did to. He was a righteous man. It says that he was a righteous man. But you know you've got when you think of the book of Job, you you can't just pick all the bad bits out and build a theology around that because you've got to look at the end of it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was back on his feet again. He was restored. You know, so I say this, and I know this is a bit unorthodox, right, but I say this to people. If you think you're like, people say, well, I'm like Job, I'm suffering. You know what I say to them? I say, well, you better expect to be blessed then. Hmm. Because he did suffer, but in the end, God restored him. Yeah, yeah. And he was to teach him about the sovereignty of God. Yeah. God said to him, where were you when I created the earth? Where were you? Where were you when I did this? You know, and the lesson was, I'm God, you're man. You know, so <clears throat> that's just, so it develops our character. The third benefit is it helps us to learn obedience as well. <coughs> Hebrews 5, 8 says, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Yeah. You know, if, if, if Jesus had to learn obedience, I don't understand all the theology in this, how much more do we? And obeying God is the key if we want to grow spiritually. Yeah. Uh, this is a quote from Oswald Chambers. He says this, If we want insight into what Jesus teaches, we can only get it by obedience. Yeah. If things are dark to us, then I may be sure there is something I will not do. Spiritual darkness comes because of something I do not intend to obey. No man ever receives a word from God without it instantly being put to the test over it. We disobey and wonder why we do not go on spiritually. Mm. So it's, it's talking about, you know, obedience as well. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? Um. Uh. I like I like Joel words. He says, "I know that my redeemer liveth." Yeah. Uh. And when we were at seminary and we studied Job, it was interesting to find that all the commentaries, bar none, couldn't really admitted that they couldn't really grasp fully the form of the book because there's poetry, there's prose so it was that every scholar found it difficult to find out what the genre was of the book which shows you how deep and profound the book is that yeah. you know it's, it's bigger than even modern scholarship and I, I thought what you said about Job was brilliant it was really uh, really encouraging and helpful yeah yeah so the next bit is what benefit can come from experiencing evil and suffering a growth towards holiness that teaches us to take responsibility for our lives mm. I'm basically saying God uses it to help us grow up to mature um, you know there's a quote I've got in here change is, in in it, change is inevitable but growth is optional you know there's always going to be change yeah. in our lives but how we respond to that is up to us. Yeah. We can either grow with the change and come closer to God or, or shrink. Wow, that's really profound, that, mate. That's really amazing, yeah. And I've put this, I don't know if you agree with this quote here, but I've put, a life of blessing and victory comes by choice, not by chance. Yeah. 
making the right choices, the godly choices. You know, God doesn't make our cho- sometimes God God <clears throat> does not make all our choices for us because he he trusts us. I mean, he's got the divine plan for us. That's something different. The divine plan is all of God. Yeah. You know, but it's like um, that's to do with God's sovereignty and eternal purposes. But he's not going to make all our choices for us mm. because he gives us the freedom for us to decide. <coughs> you know? Yeah. It's like David Post explained the sovereignty of God and human choice like this. He says, God's purpose is, it's like, it's like a, a timetable. Say you're, at, say you're at school, there's a timetable on Monday. You'd have geography, English, maths. Tuesday, you'd have history, PE. Yeah. Wednesday, you have... Um, you have physics, chemistry, um, English literature. Mm. Basically, on every given day of the week, you know what the timetable is. Yeah. Right? But sometimes God comes in and changes it over and changes the timetable on the Monday. Mm. Um, I'm still trying to work all this out because it's a bit Armenian, but God gives us a lot of freedom mm. so we, we, he teaches us to grow take responsibility mm. uh, I've put this here we are not the product of what has happened to us we are the product of how we responded to what has happened to us yeah I, I totally agree with that mate yeah it's like the two thieves on the cross both dying next to Jesus yeah. One repents. Oh, sorry. One mocks him. He says, "What are you doing? Save yourself and us." Yeah. And the other one says, "You know, he's a just man. He's done nothing wrong." Yeah. And then he says, "He's helped me by coming to your kingdom." You know. Um, you get you 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 in the contemporary literature as well. You get two people, two lads, both in the same family. Same same opportunities. One goes up, one goes up and, be, and becomes a thief. Another becomes like a lawyer or something. You know, mm. it's all to do with how it's all to do with how we respond yeah. to what we experience. So that, that's that one. Um, what benefit can come from experiencing evil and suffering? A grow towards holiness that leads to an intimacy with God. That is key, that. It's what people are thirsting for deep in the heart, whether they know it or not. Yeah, yeah. It's like St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Yeah. And you know, all human addictions, what they really are, the uh, all human addictions and sin, all, all human addictions and sin, Yeah. They're, it's a cry <laughs> of the heart. Mm. For an intimate relationship with God. Yeah. No, people are trying to get back into the garden before the fall. That's what we're looking for. Wow. Before sin entered the world. We're trying to find our way back to the garden. And um, That's an amazing thought. Uh, I was just thinking of Steinbeck's East of Eden. Oh, yeah. And about how uh, the whole book is like a parable. That in the in the Great Depression, these people are travelling around trying to trying to get um, trying to get l- their life sorted out. But the title East of Eden is like a parable of what you're saying, like people are trying to get back to the garden. Yeah, yeah. I think as well with this intimacy as well, right? Is <clears throat> what desires intimacy with us? Yeah. More than we desire it with him. I find that amazing. Wow. Yeah. You know, God, God's God's heart. God wants it more than we do, brother. Yeah, yeah. Which I find amazing as well. And the thing is, as well as people, people see God more. So it seems to be that a lot of people find God mm. when at a moment of suffering in their lives. Mm. A moment of desperation. Mm. Um, that's when people seem to see God. Yeah. 
for some reason. Mm. Um, and the last one is, what benefit can come from experiencing evil and suffering? A goal towards holiness that develops our love and empathy for other people. Yeah. I was just saying, everything God does has a redemptive purpose. <coughs> Second Corinthians 1 4 says this God who comforts us in all our tribulation, mm. that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Mm. And I was saying this, you know, you can go through things in your life that make no sense to you and you can go through suffering and you pray to God and you, it can be 20 years later and you think I don't understand why I went through that yeah, yeah. and sometimes God in his sovereign plan he designed it so we're not meant to understand it it's not meant to be meaning to us yeah. but our suffering is meant to bring meaning to other people yeah so we might not understand why we went through certain suffering, but when, when we share our stories with other people, <coughs> yeah. it brings hope to other people. It, it was meant in God's divine plan to help and heal somebody else. Yeah. But God used us as the tool. Seen in the, he could be seen in the future how he was going to use that thing we went through. Um... So it's about developing love and em empathy mm. for other people and that. So that's just a, f a few points. I th I, it's not an exhaustive list, and I think some people might disagree with this. Yeah, I thought I thought it was brilliant, Mark. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, you should do more of them, mate. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You got, got a real gift. Well, I mean, you can ex Barbara. expand all of that. But I looked through scripture and I thought it's gonna it's gotta be about holiness. Yeah. Something to do with holiness and growing in holiness and faith being developed and character being developed and you know growing closer to God. Yeah. I I I I um when I was at, I was with with the Methodist um I um I remember uh, in this circuit area where I was stationed for a while, there was this um, couple uh, in one of the areas, and the wife had cancer, and mm. she was she was dying, and it was really really serious. And I never forget that she, her face was like glowing, and there was this like real presence of God. And there was, she had real peace and real joy. And I remember some of the people um, who knew her said, uh, you know, she's amazing because uh, she's really suffering and she's really going through it, and yet she's just got this peace with God. Mm. And um, so, you know, that she was going through a really, really tough time. And yet, you could see Christ in her. You could see Christ formed in her. And uh, mm. so, we can look at people as well and see see their journeys and see what what they've <clears throat> what they've gone through and how God's been with them. And like you said, in our own lives, where it talks about in one Corinth is it two Corinthians? Where, where it's it um, Second Corinthians one four, yeah, yeah. Where it says the God of all comfort who comforts us so that we can comfort others or something like that yeah and you see it in your own life in my life I mean I've gone through situations I remember like the last five years I've gone through various things and I've met people and they've been going through the same thing and I've been able to say well I understand you and you, you can put yourself in their shoes because you've been there yeah and, and I think also it should give you some encouragement and hope for us that when we do go through difficult times, when we do go through hard times and it can be quite despairing sometimes but to think that you will get through it and then God will use you and use the what you've gone through and you'll meet someone who's gone, going through exactly what you've gone through and you'll be just the person to help them 
Yeah. I thought it was good that you said that that God allows these things so that so that it teaches us more compassion to other people that we go through things and then we meet people who we can help but it's changed us suffering's changed us so that we can we look at things in a a more compassionate way and when you think about it God's ways are amazing that they're not our ways and in and he's multi multi dimensional and he's he's doing all these amazing things through our lives even through suffering and we don't realize it yeah yeah, I found a good apologetic as well on suffering, Jace, when we talk to people, when I've talked to people. Yeah. <clears throat> some people have said, well, if there was no suffering in the world and no evil, then I would believe in an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God. Yeah. And I say to them, but you won't, because I say to them, the absence of suffering and evil is not proof that you will believe in a good God. And the proof of that is that's what it was like in the beginning with Adam and Eve. Wow, yeah. There was not no there was no evil there. There was no suffering there. So what I say is I say to them, you can't you can't use that as an excuse to say that you'll believe in a good God if there was no suffering and evil, because that's what it was like in the beginning. But I always think this, you, to, understand, to understand the heart of God, you've got to look at redemption history. You've got to look at the beginning of the story and the end. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. At the beginning, there's no sin. Yeah. There's no death. There's fellowship with God. There's perfection in the garden. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, what, and the end's going to be the same. When God reverses it, he talks about, again, God wiping away all our tears. There's no more sin, no more crying, no more death. Yeah. So that we need a theology, all theology of, a theology of suffering. To, want to, have a, to have a correct biblical theology of suffering, yeah. I think we need a correct theology of the nature of God. Yeah. And it's clear in Scripture to me. You've just got to look at Genesis and Revelation, the beginning and the end. Yeah, I, I think what you just said is really brilliant, really, really uh, brilliant. Uh, and it's interesting that when you look at the early church fathers, when you look at Athanasius or you go back to uh, Irenaeus when he was taken on the Gnostics, when, whenever they were confronted with an issue, they always did this historical group this historical overview from beginning mm. to end they use the whole timeline of the Bible the whole story of the Bible to counteract the Gnostics to counteract the heretics and um, what you did what you've done tackling this issue about suffering is you've taken the whole story uh, yeah. from beginning to end and use that as an apologetic to try and understand suffering and uh, that's brilliant. That's that's what we need to do. I took it when I preached this at the church. I preached at the church at the Nazarene. Yeah. A woman came up to me afterwards. <laughs> and you met her. Call it all when she plays. She plays the uh, organ. You know, when you came. Yeah. And she she says to me. She says thanks for doing that. She says it was very brave of you. So what that told me is there's not many pastors and leaders even trying to even tackle it, tackle it, because it's a massive subject, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's a massive thing, you know. But I think what's important is, whatever people's understanding of suffering and evil is, we can't limit the nature of God. Yeah. We've got to understand all suffering and evil in the context that God is all powerful. Yeah. God is all knowing and God is all good. Yeah, I... I... I agree. I think uh, the problem with the Gnostics in the early church, um, like uh, in the time of Irenaeus, um, the problem with them is they try to answer the problem of suffering by going out of the bounds of Scripture. So what they said, they they did they they kind of use logic rather than Scripture. So they said, well, if the suffering in the world 
that means it must have been God that created it. So they did, they, they used logic. If the suffering, it must have come from God. God can't allow suffering. So what they did, they invented another God behind this, their other God, and another God behind that. And so the, they became polytheist, and they invented these whole schemes of different gods to try and get God away from this issue of suffering. Mm. You know, and so the, the lesson there is if, is if you go beyond the bounds of Scripture and if you push logic too far, then you, you, if, you, if you don't recognize that what Scripture says, it gives us the boundaries to think. But if you go beyond that boundary, you try to peer into it more, then you're just going to lose that framework that you need to, to deal with suffering. And that God's given us enough knowledge to be able to, to cope. There, there has to be an element of faith. Mm. Um, we have certain knowledge that God has given us about the fall and the end and the beginning. But ultimately, God's ways are not our ways, and there is an element where, where, where we have to f have faith. I mean, Job, Job at the end of it was challenged by God. Were you there when I created the world? Job says, you know, no. Were you there when I created the animals? No. So I'll do what I want, says God, in a way, because I'm God. Yeah. And everybody is confronted with that in their own experience. There comes a point at which every human being is challenged to either live by faith or live by their own wisdom. And yeah. God has given us enough enough knowledge. He's, he's shown us that he came and suffered on the cross. He's shown us about the fall that you've shown us. He's shown us all these texts that you've shown us. And he's given us the resources to deal with the issue. But ultimately, he, he knows everything. And ultimately, there are times in our life where we will go through suffering, and it might be he, he's well, it is changing us for for glory, but we might not fully understand the full ramifications of that event. But he knows the full ramifications, and we have to yeah. trust. We have to trust him. And it's the same with the world. Uh, there might be a, a a major catastrophe that happens. You know, God knows the reason. There was a, a tower fell in one of the Gospels, wasn't there? And it killed a lot yeah. of people. And people were saying that tower fell because they were evil people. And it fell and killed them because they were evil. And the Lord Jesus rebuked them. Mm -hmm. Because they were judging, they, they were assessing that event and as if they knew what God was doing in that event. So there are these general principles that that God has given us about what you've and what you've shared with us today. But in in all, whenever things are happening, big suffering events and everything like that, we have to be careful. Uh, either whether as a Christian or as an atheist or whatever, we have to be careful not to assume that we know more than God. That He He knows He knows the end of the beginning. He, he knows the issue. Uh, and we have to say that God is God, and that's not anti-intellectual or anti-thing. It's just the fact that ultimately only God can be trusted uh, with the not with the full knowledge, and we trust Him with that. We we can't know everything. Yeah. Those are my thoughts, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So we're seeing that you know, you know, God understands suffering. Because he suffered himself and his son. Yeah. And I'll just end it with this quote here. Or you, you can, if you want to add anything else to it. It says, For whatever reason God chose to make man, <coughs> as he is limited and suffering and subject to sorrow and death, he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game people think he's playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair, and more than that, he has forgiven us. Wow, that is a brilliant quote. Who was that? 
I, I can't remember. I, I got it out of um, some book. I've, I've not I've not quoted the author. That was an amazing quote, mate. Yeah, it's good. So that that's it. I don't know if there's you no. thought any any more thoughts. Uh, no, I think I think it was amazing. I think it would really encourage you, Mark. Really, really encourage you. You should do more of them, mate. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to close then. Uh, folks, fa thanks for coming. And uh, anybody listening out there, I know there's been one person all through this listening and mate, one or two popping in and out from time to time. And there'll be more in the next few days listening to this uh, Bible study. So thanks for coming and uh, listening to what Mark's had to share and our, our little discussion. And uh, we just hope that you get blessed from it. Uh, so we're going to close in prayer. So I don't know, Mark, if you'd like to close in prayer, mate. Yeah. <clears throat> Father God, thank you that your word tells us, Lord, that you are all good, all knowing and all powerful. And Lord, that you have a good plan for our life, Lord, that you long for us to know you intimately. You long for us to know you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that you've shown your love to us in sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer on a cross for our sins, Lord, and the sins of the world, mm. that we can be forgiven and restored into fellowship with you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you know each personal story, Father, each personal hurt, each memory you've ever had, each experience we've been through, Lord, you know it all, Lord. Your word says that our tears, Lord, are kept in your bottle, Lord, and written in your book. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us through times of suffering, Lord, that we sense your presence with us, we sense your peace. And that we'd know, Lord, that you will never leave us off for circus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise you, Lord. Amen. Well, thank you, Mark. That was really, really good, mate. And uh, so everybody else out there, I uh, hope to see you uh, sometime. Like I said, I'll be taking a break for some time. And uh, just thank you. We came on because Mark had a word to share. And I uh, hope you all got a blessing. So God bless you all and take care.